to the Rental Property Cafe podcast, our second edition. Hi, I'm Veronica Woods, a real estate advisor, along with my co-host, Cynthia Meyer, a real estate financial planner. Good morning. Good morning. What's in your cup this morning? I'm still drinking my second cup of coffee, but it's a mid-80s here in the Philadelphia area, so I should really be drinking some water to keep hydrated. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm excited to still chat with you on video today, even though you may hear some fans blowing in the background. Hopefully it's not too distracting. Oh, no, not at all. And yeah, it's pretty warm up here too. I guess I, what I'm about two hours north of you. And I'm drinking some tea in my XY Planning Network mug, which they sent me for some reason, but I, I like it. I'm very happy. And looking forward to getting outside today. So after tax week, especially. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that segues into our topic for today, talking about the numbers of real estate investing. Yes. I know that's a topic that mm -hmm. we both share the love for and really helping to coach our investor clients to pay attention to the numbers, not just when you first buy the property, but through their, their whole lifeline of mm -hmm. a whole life cycle of owning the property. Veronica, you're so right. And today we're going to talk about some of the common rental property budget mistakes that both of us have seen people do through the course of our businesses. And we have a slightly different perspective on it. For me, I often see people that are unrealistic about their rental property budgets or unrealistic about how a property is going to cash flow or what they should include in the budget. Veronica, because you work more with professional investors, what do you see? Oh, well, I would say I see the same thing. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely work with a lot of newbies, but they're open to looking at the numbers. They, they know that when they first make the investment, they're conscious of the numbers have to work. So they know it. They don't know what those numbers are. And mm -hmm. I see the same thing that, that you see that their expectations aren't realistic. It's important. I t tell them it's important to know whether you're losing or making money, especially as you yes. um, get more and more properties to look at it at a portfolio perspective. You really mm -hmm. have to know the numbers on each individual um, property in terms of the numbers, operating income, are you generating positive cash flow? So I definitely see the same concerns, especially if you don't have a financial background. It's just something that's foreign to, to some folks. And mm -hmm. it's hard to know whether you have the right assumptions. You're absolutely right. In my financial planning practice, I encourage people to think about this is described as passive income, but real estate is also a business. You have to write yeah, it like yeah. a business. Uh, I think kicks off the, the number one rental property budget mistake that we see people make, which is underestimating all the variable expenses, right? It's not too hard to figure out what your mortgage and your property taxes and your property insurance is because you may be having that deducted every month by your mortgage lender. But things like maintenance and repairs, utilities, garbage, water, landscaping or snow removal, capital expenditures like putting in a new washing machine, or even figuring out what is a good vacancy rate, right? There are assumptions which impact what those assumptions are. Um, I would say that probably underestimating maintenance costs is the biggest component of that. Maintenance costs ideally should be 1% to 4% of the purchase price based on the age and the condition of the property. The newer home may be figure 1% of the purchase price and the older fixer upper Victorian could be up to 4% of the purchase price. This is a mistake that new homeowners make too. Those aren't expenses that happen every month. You have to plan for them and set aside reserves so that two or three years down the road when you need a new air conditioner or you have to replace the roof, you have saved up for it. Yeah, I'll just piggyback off of the thing that you mentioned about an older home, especially if we have watchers or listeners in the Northeast where there are a lot of older homes. If when you first purchase the property, you don't do a major upgrade of the systems and mechanicals, mm -hmm. you could just count on that your average maintenance costs are going to be a little higher. If you are buying an older home, you definitely want to err toward more of the um, conservative um, point of view for, for that kind of property. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. When you have a new investor, Veronica, what do you encourage people to use as the vacancy? It really depends on the neighborhood. Everything in terms of having good assumptions, you don't want to take a big picture assumption of somebody in LA when you're in Baltimore, right? <laughs> but you really need to think about how long it's going to take you to find a tenant. And then there's a handy formula, maybe you can put it in the sh show notes where you can take how long it's going to take you to find a tenant and back into what that would be on a monthly basis. That's really the best way to do it. Really think about, is this an area where it's going to take you a month to find a tenant, or is this an area where it's going to take you three months to find a good quality tenant? I should emphasize mm -hmm. that. That's a really good point. I know in our personal rental property portfolio, my husband and I, over time, we realized that there's always a month turnover. We're, we are not going to turn a, a property over in one to two weeks. There's always a month to do some repairs or painting and maybe replace the carpet if that's needed. We always plan for at least a month vacancy when the property is turning over. And I, and I should say, or we forgot to mention, we have six tips. They're not in any necessarily order of importance, but we feel like these are all things that you should think about. I'll jump into mistake number two, which is not budgeting enough for these turnover expenses. Like you said, it may take 30 days to do that work to prepare for a new tenant. You may not have that every year, but depending on the size of the unit, especially if it's a smaller unit of let's say um, studio, the two bedroom apartments, they mm -hmm. just naturally attract more turnover just by the nature of people who want to live in those properties. That means when you're two years in, you need to make sure that you're accounting for maybe having a higher expense during that month. Mm -hmm. The areas where I see most of the expense happening are either cleaning, painting, and flooring repairs. Mm -hmm. I always throw in the wild card, the thing that you can't see when the tenant's living there and they didn't tell you about it. So until you do that final walkthrough with the tenant and you can see maybe there was a, a slow leak from a seal around the window. So that's the unexpected wild mm -hmm. card that you may not even predict. But even if you have the best of tenants and they took great care of the property, there's always some surprises. So I say kind of safeguard that every, let's say, two to three years on, on the low end for a tenant probably vacating and then having this bump in expenses. Uh, you're so right, because in my experience as a, a rental property owner, there are always things that you don't expect, which means that you should expect them. You're going to have a new towel rack or replace the railing on a stairs. There's always going to be something you just don't know exactly what that's something. And I forgot to say, it also related to the turnovers, there's actually an expense to getting a new tenant. Whether you pay for a realtor to find a tenant or you do it yourself, there's marketing, there's time mm -hmm. showing the property, there's screening applications. There's a number of expenses that you only get when the property turns over that you should have in your budget. Uh, we use a property manager and I, I think that leads to our third most common mistake. Yes, and I do property management work as part of my business supporting clients. So the number three mistake is to not include the expenses for this property management job in your budget. Even if mm -hmm. you're doing it yourself, someone is doing the, the work of managing a property mm -hmm. from collecting rents to talking to the tenants to handling all the, the legal paperwork. All that is a job. Now, even if you plan to start out with managing it yourself, it's important that the numbers will continue to work and you still be profitable if by chance you have to outsource it at some point in time. And this happens. Sometimes it's unpredictable. Let's say your job relocates to another part of the country. You're too far mm -hmm. away. You suddenly become busy with another um, priority. Or, God forbid, you, you get sick. I had a client... Um, she was planning when she retired early, thinking that she would manage her rental properties. She had six or seven properties and she had a medical crisis. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden she could not physically take care of her properties. 
and she outsourced it to my company, we were able to jump in. But luckily she had the cash flow to cover that expense. So it wasn't a big deal. But if you think about it after the fact, it, it could be a very stressful situation to not be able to do a quality property management job. That's an excellent point. And I would say as somebody who works mostly with professionals who have significant real estate side hustles, as well as some professional real estate investors, there's an opportunity cost. What else could you be doing in your life that you could be more productive in terms of your time or your income that you could turn over to a professional property manager? And obviously it's totally your choice, but you may have to do it at some point. So it's good to know how much it's going to cost if you're going to need to do it. And is your property still going to be profitable. I think that the main point is that there's some benefits besides the use of your time to, and then this is, this podcast isn't about the, the benefits of using a property manager, but as it relates to the budget, the property manager can help you track those expenses in a way that the novice or newbie just isn't used to it and mm -hmm. ha help you organize that data in a way that you can make sense of it over time as well as maybe help you negotiate lower repair costs. You have a smaller holdings, just one or two properties. You're not going to get the same discounts of whether you had 10 or more properties. And then that's where you can really start negotiating with vendors about giving mm -hmm. deals. But if you're small, there's benefits of managing the budget or managing your re repair expenses, specifically if you were using a property manager. Uh, I totally agree. And, and in our personal experience, again, using a professional property manager, it can be faster, right? If we need something to happen, they might be able to get somebody there the same day or the next day. So I also appreciate that. The fourth uh, most common rental property budget mistake that I see, and I'm wondering if you see it too, Veronica, is just not having sufficient cash reserves and not prioritizing building them over time when you add a new property to the portfolio. Uh, I encourage people to add to their cash reserves every month. As we mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, reserving for capital expenditures, for vacancy rates, for plan spending down the road, any repairs or turnover expenses that you're going to make, figuring out what that is up front and putting that money away in a separate savings account, ideally segregating it in your QuickBooks or whatever system you're using to track your rental property budget it, it is making sure that you have enough cash reserves in case the worst happens. Don't be overly optimistic about how much rent is going to come in and how little you're going to spend. And we think we've all seen this during COVID, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that there are tenants who can't pay their rent and, and you're not able to turn over the unit, but you still have to continue to pay all the expenses. One thing when, if you're getting a loan to buy the property, the mm -hmm. banks really kind of force you to have the initial reserves mm -hmm. um, in, in your bank to, to allow you to get the loan approved. But I think you also, as you're managing the property over time, you're also tested about, do you really have enough reserves for your investment? Which I'll segue over to the fifth mistake, which is not monitoring mm -hmm. your budget actuals versus your budget on a regular basis. I find that the end of the year is a good time to look at your budget against um, the actual performance because month by month could vary depending on what happens. We were talking about when you have a, a turnover, that's going to be an unusually higher month. But once you get a full 12 months, you have enough data to really compare. Now, if you just bought the property, I would compare your actuals versus your original assumptions before you bought the property. If you've had the property for a few years, every time looking back at the previous year and see if there's any trends that you should watch out for. Are there months, a lot of them so you're negative. Are there a trend in certain types of expenses? Like you have a lot of plumbing expenses. Are you thinking about planning for to take care of one of those larger capital projects soon? 
putting that in your budget on a kind of schedule or plan basis really helps you better manage the property overall, as well as help you direct where your rent should be. Obviously you want to charge the market rent, but you also want to make sure that market rent covers your operating uh, expenses <laughs> so that you're actually making money. A lot of people get in the holes because they're charging below market rent and then they're wondering why they're not profitable. But that is a cause to raise your rent. Now you can't just jack up the rent on people. If you have an existing tenant, you have to go according to your lease and that should prescribe what the increase would be as well as when you can communicate that. Mm -hmm. If you're seeing that you're running a little low or you have a planned capital expenditure, that might be a good time to raise the rent by 5%. That's the standard in terms of best practice and not raise the rent more than 5% on an existing tenant. Mm -hmm. Now, if the property is vacant, that's why there's a lot of opportunity to really recalibrate the rent when there's a vacancy, because then you can make sure that your new tenant is going in right at market rate. That could mean that you might need to do some repairs or some upgrades in order to make sure that, let's say, the $1,500 a month rent on your block, your house looks like that. But it may be worth it to invest in those incremental repairs if you can raise your rent by a few hundred dollars, let's say. There's a lot of opportunity right now, in my opinion, in general in the market, uh, not as much in single family homes where there's a lot of competition for new homeowners, but in these small multifamilies and small apartment buildings, that's a good way to think about it. If you're looking for something, maybe it needs a little refresh, some minor repairs, some new appliances, for example, some changes in the bathroom to make it so it's going to be attractive to that market rate wrencher. So that's a really good point. I would say number six, and you touched on this a little bit, Veronica, is I see folks who just aren't tracking their budget at all. As you said, comparing your projected budget to the actual result is going to help you be a better investor. Now, real estate uh, investing in direct investing in properties is a learn by doing experience and it's going to help you be a better investor. It's going to help if you're actually profitable. The point is to run and track the numbers in using any tool that you prefer. In our real estate business, we use a, a combo of an Excel analysis of the entire portfolio, which I also do for clients, and then QuickBooks. But there are many ways to track your numbers. There are different free calculators online. A any favor that you have in terms of number tracking, Veronica? Not really. You named some of the same ones that I use. I think the, the key thing is the one to put the numbers in a, a system that you can use, but then you have to look at them. They have a property manager. They're giving you reports every uh. week of insight of what's going on. But if you're not looking at them, then you can't make sense of them to make the strategic decisions because you can't figure out what you need to turn around if you don't know where you stand. You can't improve what you can't measure. It, it goes with um, real estate as well. You don't know, like, do I have a rent problem? Do I have a repair problem? Do I have... A tenant, so it's, you uh, don't really know how you can turn your situation around if you need to. Yeah, whether it's an individual rental property or it's a portfolio of 20 properties and syndications and loans that you've made for others, the budget is your overall financial plan expressed in numbers. So you got to track. We've got uh, many great ideas in the hopper. We hope that you will watch the next one up and see some of our previous recordings. If you have an idea about a topic you'd like us to tackle, leave it down below in the comments and please subscribe. And if you're watching this on um, our YouTube channel, definitely give us your comments. We want to hear from you. In the show notes, uh, we're going to drop some resources that relate to this budget topic. And if you've got comments, questions, things you like or don't like about the podcast, please let us know. Drop them in the comments below, subscribe to the channel, or email us at podcast at realliefplanning.com.